Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Making Waves with Wet podcast. In every episode, you'll get a glimpse into the latest news, insights, and the real people who are making waves in the wastewater industry. Plus, you'll hear the stories and some of the behind the scenes secrets about how wet comes together. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. So good morning, everybody. My name is Valerie Jenkinson, and I am the chair of Operators Without Borders. So just to tell you a little bit about what Operators Without Borders is, and then I'm going to pass it over to two of my volunteers who are online from Ontario, Canada, and they're going to tell you about their experiences with volunteering with Operators Without Borders. So I have been privileged enough to work in the Caribbean for about 12 to 14 years now. And I had a company, and we did climate change mitigation. We did a lot of training. And so it's a small community in the Caribbean. There's a lot of islands, and they all have a water utility that's a national water utility. There's no provincial or municipal statewide uh, water and wastewater utilities. So when you go to the conference once a year, you see all the general managers and all the people from the utilities. And I got to know them over 14 years very, very well. As you probably know, the Caribbean is hit by hurricanes pretty well every year. We have a disaster. And in 2017, we had one of the really big disasters because we got hit first by Hurricane Maria and then by Irma. And it hit many islands. Some of the islands were supported by local governments, like the um, uh, St. Martin's is supported by the Dutch. Uh, Anguilla would be supported by the English. Dominica, even though a Commonwealth country, was hit terribly badly. And they don't have a lot of support. So at the conference in Trinidad, The keynote speaker at the plenary was the general manager, Bernard Etanoff, from Dominica. He's the general manager of the water and wastewater utility in Dominica. Dominica, for those of you who don't know, it's a small island, population of about 70,000, and a beautiful island. It's, It's very lush. It's one of the islands that does have water. They have a lot of water. They have a centralized, uh, for part of the island, wastewater system. You have to recognize that in the Caribbean, only 3% of wastewater is treated. 3%. Now, there's places like Barbados, where they have two, what they call treatment plants. I had one of my volunteers down there. He said, that's not a treatment plant. They just got a bar and a screen, and then everything else is just going straight into the ocean. There is a reason when I'm living down there that when I do the crawl, when I'm swimming, I never put my face in the water. I know better. Uh, We don't publish any results from any testing that goes on because a lot of tourists would not like to see those results. Anyway, Dominique is a beautiful island, very, very lush, lots of trees, lots of water. But after the hurricane in 2017, there was not literally a house on the island that was not damaged in some way. Many were completely destroyed and were just rubble. Many hotels were rubble. And so after Bernard gave his speech, and I remember him saying that he was off the island when he first came, uh, when, the, when the hurricane hit. His family was back in Dominica. He was off island. And he did everything to get home after the hurricane. Couldn't get a flight. Couldn't get a, a ferry. So he and two other people rented a small boat probably a fishing boat, and travel from Guadeloupe to Dominica. He said he thought he was going to die. (laughs) It was just like this in a small boat. But he said when he got into Dominica, he said he looked at the harbor and started to cry. It was so badly damaged. And so I went up to Bernard after he'd made his presentation, and I said, Bernard, how can we help? What do you need? And he said, we need everything. He said, we've got nothing left. He said, our stores were looted. So we don't have a pair of gloves. We have nothing to give our operators. A lot of our operators have lost their homes, or they don't, you know, everything is sodden. They don't have proper clothes to wear. We need everything. He said, but honestly, we could use some help in rebuilding. 
So I was on my way back to Canada to go to the, the what I call the other CWWA. You have the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association, but we also have the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association. And I was on my way back to speak at the Canadian Water and Wastewater Association. So I phoned up Robert Hallard, our executive director, and said, Robert, look, here's the situation. These people need help. Would you allow me to speak at your conference and also do some fundraising so we could maybe get some help? He, and he jumped right on it. He said, absolutely. He gave me a spot on the plenary session, and he asked all the exhibitors to bring a gift that they could raffle. So I made a presentation. We got a huge number of people who said, I'll volunteer. I can't go right now. But we had three people who said, yes, we can go. And we had enough money that we raised at the conference to send them. And I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about some of our volunteers because I have one of the, f uh, Jason, who's with us, is, was one of the, well, he was the first volunteer, but along with two other people who volunteered to go, and I'm going to let him tell his story. But since that time, we saw the success that our operators had had and said, well, okay, this seems to be a good idea. There's hurricanes every year. We've got a lot of people that are volunteering. Why don't we set up an organization? So we came up with a name, very, very original name. You've all heard of Doctors Without Borders. You've heard of Engineers Without Borders. So we're Operators Without Borders. It wasn't, it wasn't a big uh, stretch to do that. So and our objective, we have a twofold objective. The very first objective we had was to help water and wastewater utilities in developing countries to recover after disasters. But we got 60 or 70 volunteers. We didn't need that many people to send to disasters, but I looked at the resumes of these people, and you know, all these level four operators, people managing plants, all a huge rectum, a, a spectrum of people, and a lot of them had done training. Now, having worked in the Caribbean for so long, I knew that training is very, very limited. I was in Barbados, and I went up to one fellow, and I said, how long have you worked for Barbados Water Authority? He said, oh, I've been working here 29 years. I said, OK, how, long, how, many, how much training have you had in that 29 years? And he looked at me and he go, oh, I got one day. One day of formal training in 29 years. Now, at the time, I owned the largest water and wastewater training company in Canada. So I said, OK, we can do something here. I've, I've donated all of our 70-odd courses, including all the exam preparation courses, um, to Operators Without Borders. And we started offering training. And we decided we'd formalize this organization. So we had the first mandate, which was to do the disaster training. But then the other one was, let's provide training, completely free of charge, to anybody in a developing country. And so that's what we've been doing. And, and Mac, who's our other volunteer on here, he's going to talk to you a little bit about that. So the things that we do, we do a lot of training. And we mentor, because when our volunteers go down there, as Jason and Mac will both tell you, they make lifelong friends. The guys in the Caribbean are absolutely fabulous to work with. And so when we come back, we don't just go there and do something and then disappear. We're there for them. And there's phone calls going on all the time. So we do that. We do operational assessments where we go in and have a look at their operations and make suggestions. Now, it's, it's interesting. Most of the water and wastewater managers in the Caribbean have master's degrees. Some of them have a double master's degrees. And sometimes when people go down there from North America, they're treated, or Europe, they're treated like they're somewhat stupid. They are not stupid. What they don't have is the resources and the money. So they don't have all the new technologies. If you walk into one of their plants, you go, whoa, this is something for the 1940s. So they don't have the experience of running top utilities. Very often, rate and tariff increases are a real problem because it gets so political down there. Many, many, many of the utilities have not had a rate increase for over 15 years. Think of running a utility and not, or you getting a, you know, running your own household and not having a pay increase for 15 years. How do you think you'd do? Some of them are on the verge of bankruptcy. I, I, my headquarters is in St. Lucia. They would have been bankrupt if they had paid their utility bill, which is also a quasi, both government agencies 
so they didn't pay the utility bills. The only thing that kept them afloat. You know, I was talking to somebody um, uh, in the Bahamas, and I said, what does an operator earn? He said, well, he said it depends on their level, but maybe $1,500 a month. But you start off at about 800. So 800 and then you graduate up. And let me tell you, living on these islands is expensive. Food is really expensive. So this is where we go in and help because they can't afford the training. It is not sustainable. You know, we used to do training down there and it would cost them $10,000 for a week's training. They just don't have that money to train all their people. What they do is they get a grant from the International Development Bank or from the Caribbean Development Bank and the local association who we work with, COASA, they will put on a training and everybody sends one operator. That's what they've got the funding for. And what happens when they go back to the utility? What are they told by the rest of their guys? We're not do their work. Yeah, that's not how we do it here. You know, that's what we've done. You know, we were talking to some, we were doing some training last week and the guy said, is that what we're supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we do. <laughs> so the education, when it's free, we can go in and send one person to train their whole work group and start getting things on best practices. With, we're also doing a lot of certification training. So there's all sorts of things that we are doing. So where are we now? 2018, we got our nonprofit status. We got a charitable status. Oh, it shouldn't be 2019. 2019. And approximately 70 volunteers right now from both Canada and the United States. We had guys going down from Ohio. Um, we have become a charity of choice for WEF, um, and we're very grateful for that. AWWA has been supporting us. Uh, we are the, probably the only charity in the world that focuses on water and wastewater utilities and operators. So we're not a first responder. I work with the WASH group. If anybody's not familiar with WASH, that's Water and Sanitation and Hygiene. And this is the humanitarian group that goes in after any disaster and does, you know, sort of the, what we call first responders. They bring in bottled water. They set up remote, remote osmosis systems, etc. We don't do that. In a disaster, we wait until there's equipment and it is safe to go. And usually that is a couple, two and a half months later. So we have, very proud of this, we have done, it's actually nearer $2 million worth of work on a budget of about $60,000. We have no paid staff. Everybody is a volunteer. Um, I'm lucky, because I'm not, am I lucky to be older? <laughs> that I can sort of take the time now to do these things. So I basically work full time as the chair of Operators Without Borders, but it is a volunteer position. And, and we have incredible volunteers. So, going on. And the next one. So, we're going to talk first about the capacity building, about the um, training and assessments that we do. We've done Belize, Bahamas, uh, Barbados. We've recently been in Kenya. We've recently been in um, four different countries, Jamaica, Belize, the Bahamas, Barbados, and St. Lucia, five countries in the last uh, month and a half, and Kenya in, in October. So I'm going to now call over uh, and introduce you to Mac, Ian McMillium, who is the compliance manager for the region of Darwin in Canada and a level four operator. He's one of our most prolific volunteers. He has done a lot of the assessments. He was in both Barbados and Belize doing assessments there. And he was just was the trainer that we sent over to do certification training of wastewater collection and wastewater treatment in Kenya. So, Mac, over to you. Um, so, Val was talking about um, disaster relief, and that is kind of uh, Jason and uh, I'm going to say a younger man's game, uh, the heavy work. Although I liked it when I was younger, um, but <clears throat> like Val said, is uh, you know we are originally disaster driven. Uh, but we certainly don't hope for disasters and, and we're not going to sit around waiting for one to occur to, to use the volunteers we have. So we went into resilience and capacity building because, you know, going in after disasters, we really learned that there, there's other issues there too. And these issues are compacting 
um, recovery and response as well. So we thought, okay, let, let's go into these utilities and get them more prepared. So when events do occur, they can always recover faster. And that's always the goal to get the water on, get the water going, because water is the life you know, of everything. So what we did was we par partnered up with utilities and when utilities reach out and, and Valerie being in the Caribbean is very good at uh, making contacts and, and using our volunteers. Uh, so when utilities reach out, we do assemble a team. Uh, it depends on what they're looking for, water, wastewater, uh, other aspects of the utility. And we'll send uh, operators down. And then we typically will do a couple of things. We'll do training sessions on targeted areas. And we'll also do assessments. And that's kind of what I like the most, uh, actually getting into the water and wastewater plants, having a look around, talking to staff. Not to say what's right or wrong, but just to have uh, some observations and then uh, present some findings to them, something they can work on um, to make their systems a little stronger. And then as we identify areas that require training, we, we do training with them. Or we can, when we've left the island or the nation, uh, we do it remotely. Um, one of the biggest issues you'll see when working in the other countries is typically uh, because it comes through, you know, a Caribbean bank or uh, other world banks. A lot of the people that get the jobs for building and designing down there, they are European nations or North America, and they have a tendency to come down, design a system, leave it and go home. Uh, they design systems that need, that have disposable parts in that, that uh, cause issues. There's little training for the staff when the systems are presented. There's little operations and manuals. So it's really sometimes not the fault or it's the situation they've been put in. Uh, so that's where Operators of Borders makes it really driven down into our volunteers that you don't just walk away. Um, if you go down and present on something, you check in later, how to go is, is you know, how, did that solution work, things like that. Um, so we've partnered up with a lot of utilities as Belize, or as Belize, as Val mentioned, um, Belize was my first trip and spent a couple weeks down there with uh, three other operators, um, great guys. And uh, we really looked at their system and provided training and it, it was a good opportunity. Uh, a lot of the folks that, like Val said, that don't often get to be trained um, there's also a bit of a political issue in a lot of utilities as well and the fact that um, sometimes people get jobs for the people they know and not necessarily their skill sets. So a lot of times the utilities are, are overstaffed with kind of somewhat underqualified people as well as the people with their masters and things like that. So when you go down there, it really is basic training that helps out and uh, it helps a lot of the staff there. Uh, so we've done that in Belize, we've done it in Barbados, and then a very interesting collaboration uh, with uh, Global Wastewater Initiative, uh, they may have a new name, if Val can say that, was uh, recently uh, we had the opportunity to go to Nakura in Kenya, and the purpose of that was to train their staff to pass certification exams to be a certified operator. Um, it, it was tricky. Uh, it was tricky due to a bit of the language barrier and a bit of uh, just the knowledge base and uh, where they worked before. But we did manage to get uh, two operators certified for collection. So to our knowledge, they are the first two operators in all of Africa to be certified operators. And, and that really is the goal, uh, to improve worldwide uh, the treatment of water and wastewater. And that's where Operators and Borders comes in. And we have a large variety of volunteers. And it's not just operators, there are engineers, there are lab technicians. Basically, if a utility has an issue, they can reach out to us and we will do our best to resolve that issue or put you in touch with other people that may not necessarily even be within Operators and Borders that can assist in that. Um, and Val's very good at uh, linking up with people and helping people and you know, we're really reaching the four corners of the world now. Originally, a lot of the work was in the Caribbean, but uh, now we ventured into Ukraine and other places. So I understand that you've got, um, when you were in Belize, you made a good friend with the, one of the managers there, and he's coming up to Canada to work with you and look at your systems, is that right? Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I work for Durham Region and uh, you know, my commissioner, John Presta, he's uh, heavily involved in WAF, uh, was the, uh, the Ontario wheel president. He 
really gets how to run a utility and treat staff. So he's he's very good at allowing me some time, although I take most of it on vacation to, to do this work, but also partnerships. So when I did work in Belize, and I'm actually going back there in a month to uh, do a one-week wastewater training course, uh, Eric Rayburn is uh, one of their supervisors there. And, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time together in Belize, and, and now we're partnering to have him come to Canada and to do a bit of a technical tour on our, our plants and our systems and then bring that knowledge back. Um, the other thing we kind of really stress too with our training is train the trainer, um, as Val said. So the opportunity to bring someone up to Canada and uh, Durham region and to, to show them live in the plants and expose them to what we have and they can bring that back and uh, those ideas and those training methods. So yeah, it's a great partnership. It's uh, unfortunately there's a crank in it like COVID did to everyone um, our consulate, Canadian consulate, closed in Belize. So it's very tricky to get to Canada to get a visa. You basically have to fly to Mexico City, get your fingerprints taken, fly back home, get approval, fly back to Mexico City, fly home and fly to Canada, which really isn't economically feasible. So uh, I'm working in the background to try to get this gentleman up. Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you, Mac. So this is the training room in Belize. We trained 120 of their staff in safety aspects. So confined space, trenching and excavating, etc. And we trained all of their operational staff, their management and their safety committee. And the reason why they were so keen to start with safety was because they just had a trenching accident. A young fellow in his early 20s was buried. Luckily, they were able to get him out before he died. He was seriously injured and he was in hospital and the, the uh, manager phoned me and said, I had to phone his mother. He said, I never ever want to have to make that phone call again. He said, she's screaming at me. I know he's dead. He's dead, isn't he? And you're not telling me. I said, he wasn't dead, but he said, I don't want to go through that again. Our people need to be trained. Safety, as Jason and Mac will both tell you, is can be atrocious in these countries. No such thing as the shoring or the confined space equipment. Um, you know, I remember one guy was told, if you go in, hold your breath. Really good for on a confined space. Um, so these guys, the, Belize is one of the better run utilities. They've got a very, very good general manager. Um, they have a little bit more money. They've got a beautiful training room, which is, you know, very different from the one Mac had to do in, in Kenya. In Kenya, we walked into a, a room with two pillars in the middle of it, which made being able to see the screen and the, um, the instructor difficult. There was just lawn chairs, plastic lawn chairs for people to sit on for five days. No desks for them to write on. We had ordered all the equipment before. I said, this is what we need. We need a screen and a projector. But when we got there, sorry, the projector in this one of the largest cities and one of the better run utilities, the projector is being used somewhere else today. So we had to find it. We thought that, um, you know, we were doing the water international, professional international uh, exams for certification online. They don't have computers. <laughs> My job was to run around and try and find 12 computers, beg, borrow, and steal. We had people who couldn't work that day because we co-opted the HR department, the customer service department, and took over their, all their computers for three hours while the guys wrote their exams. Once we got the computers, it's, okay, um, what's, your, what's your email address? Oh, don't know. So we had to find the email addresses. When we found the email addresses, do you know your password? So it was very challenging. And I remember um, going and saying to them, giving them instructions as to how to you know, advance on the exam to the next question. You hit this button here. You can go back with this button. Do not hit this button over here. Do not hit this button over here. Do you know how many of them hit that button over there? That takes you out of the whole program and says you finished. So then I was having to phone the guy in, in the United States at two o'clock in the morning and saying, how do we get them back into their exam? So it's, it's challenging, but incredibly rewarding. So can we just advance on a couple of slides and just quickly go to the next slide? There we are. 
Here's um, Ron Ellis going to do a confined space training with the guys. So what we did is in the morning we did classroom instruction and in the afternoon went out and actually gave them hands-on training. Most people are visual spatial learners. They don't, you know, learn by listening. So they need to be in there doing it. So we were very pleased that we were able to get the equipment and to be able to do this in, uh, in Belize. Next one. So here's just, this is what we do. We go around and look at everything, and then Mac and the other guys will write a report up afterwards that we submit to the utility. And there was over 100 suggestions for improvements that they might want to look at. Keep going. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, this is Skylar, who in, the, in Barbados, um, in the reverse osmosis treatment, he told me afterwards he was so excited to go there. He'd never been, um, he lives in Georgia. Uh, he was doing wastewater c collection training for exam preparation there. Had everybody passing. It was really good on their completion exam. But we took uh, some time and went to this reverse osmosis afterwards. In a state of complete ecstasy, he told me that visiting a reverse osmosis plant, a desal plant, was on his bucket list. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, not, that's not on my bucket list. <laughs> you know, Machu Picchu, uh, Antarctica is on my bucket list. His was the uh, this. It's so funny when we go to these places. I always try and give everybody at least a day where they have a really good cultural experience. With Mac, we went on safari um, and saw masses and masses of uh, beautiful animals. I said to my colleague here, uh, would you like to go to the zoo in Indianapolis? He said, I just came back from safari in Kenya, no. <laughs> uh, but we went there for a day. Um, here, um, when we were in Belize, we went to Kikaka, beautiful little island, great snorkeling. The guys are going around taking pictures of every meter and every you know, piece of equipment that they could find over there, and that's what they spend a lot of their time doing. So during the training, we did two field trips, because again, visual spatial learners. So we went into there and we talked about how this all fits together so they have a much better understanding of how the systems work rather than just learning for five days in the classroom. So the, another huge thing that we've been doing there that ties in with our working disasters is incident command system training. How many of you are familiar? If you can put a show of hands with incident command systems. Okay, not very many. Not surprising. It is the instant command is the uh, process that is used by FEMA in the United States. It's used in the Caribbean by the Caribbean Disaster Management Agency, and you have training level one to level one hundred to level four hundred. We have trained over three hundred people in level one hundred. We've just finished training up to level three hundred in th uh, three utilities in the Caribbean, and we're just entering a fourth utility. This is incredibly good training for them. It's good training for everybody. Um, Mac will say, well, he can tell you in, in his utility, they use the incident command system training. And Mac and Greg, the instructor uh, who's there, um, they wrote the standards on a lot of the this, this stuff for Canada. So we have a really, really high level of volunteerism that goes. Next picture. And just here's our, here's our group of the ICS trainees that have just uh, passed their level 300. So real accomplishment. We went to, it's interesting, here we're dealing with a water utility. We went to visit NEMA, the National Emergency Management Agency. And their, Captain Russell, who's their incident commander, said to me, are you telling me that the water utility is taken level 300? And I said, yes. He said, my guys haven't even got level 100, you better come back. He said, we need to get that training. He was astounded that in the water industry, we had gone to that level. We need to, because it isn't just hurricanes. If any of you experience floods or things like that, this is what we use as the incident process. Okay, so that's a little bit about what we do in the training area. Um, another thing that we've done is standard operating procedures. In utilities in Canada and the US, we run on standard operating procedures. I know in Canada, it is a legal requirement. You can be fined $100,000 if you have an accident and you don't have an SOP. In the Caribbean, sometimes they don't have any. Sometimes they've got a few. So again, I put a committee together, had a co-chair who was in charge of developing a set of robust standard operating procedures. We now have 225 of them 
that have been launched and any utility in a developing country can come and say, these are the, you know, we give them a list and they say, yes, we want this one, this one, this one, this one. So they can take as many as they want free of charge. And uh, having worked down there as long as I know, I know that if we give them them, nothing will happen because they need to be customized. So we assign a volunteer to that utility to help customize them. That way we then work with them to get them into practice. No use just having things that sit on a shelf. Okay, so next slide. Working with disasters. Now I'm going to introduce to you Jason Mank. Jason is on, it was the very first operator to volunteer. He went to Dominica after the hurricane. He then went to the, um, the Bahamas where Marsh Harbor was completely leveled. We had to actually take bulldozers to the town. There was nothing left. It was pretty horrendous. Um, so Jason volunteered for that one. He's a team lead. So when we send people, we always send two or three people at a time as a team. And we have a team lead who has done this type of thing before. He's also the operator rep on our board of directors. So Jason, I'm going to put the picture up of uh, downtown um, Dominica. So could you talk a little bit first about Dominica and what that was like there? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, and we're just going to review a few things that we've done here in the past, and you're going to have to live with me here because I can't see the pictures, but I'll, ma I'll make the best that I can. Um, in Dominica, we went in approximately three months after uh, the disaster, and when we got there, you could see every building had been touched by this hurricane. It, it was complete disarray, but they had done a good job to clean it up in those three months prior to us getting there. <clears throat> When we got there, all the wastewater systems had been shut down, the pump stations, our main treatment plant, and they had lost a lot of their water systems as well. So there was three of us that went down, that, uh, as Val said. Um, two of us went down to the wastewater treatment plant, and one, one of us went to start working on all the water utilities. Myself, we went down, we assessed all, all the plant, we assessed the pump stations, and then started looking after them electrically, started breaking them down individually, washing down all the equipment, looking at health and safety within these plants because as you can imagine, everything was in complete disarray. All the power lines had come down. So we, we brought in some testers, electrical meters and such, and started testing the equipment, made sure that it was gonna be operable if we could get power back to it. Once we tested everything inside the facilities, we reached out to the utilities. Because we work closely with the utility, we were able to get them in quickly and reconnect power to all these pump stations. So we were able to actually get the three pump stations back up and running that were down and then started working on the wastewater treatment plant. We, uh, we had to do some extensive work on the treatment plant. As you can imagine, after a hurricane, everything was washed down with salt water and there was a lot of debris and things that weren't working properly, but with a little bit of resourcefulness, we were able to get the pump stations and the water, the pumps of the plants back up and running. Uh, and and we were, it took a little bit to get the operators on site to understand why we were there. At first, they, they didn't really understand. They thought we were there to make money off of their equipment or something. But after a couple of days of them seeing us on the ground, boots on the ground, as Ian said, working with them, trying to better their facility, trying to make things better for their home living. Um, it, they, they jump right in with both feet and they would work long days and they, they were not scared and they were happy to learn all this equipment they had never had any kind of formal training on before. So within the two weeks, we were able to get the wastewater plant back up and running and then also get the three treatment plants in, in town to be pumping to them. So I had a number of people come up to me and just explain so much gratitude because they had been having to walk. They'd spend their whole days walking from the rivers and the ocean collecting water just so they could start flushing their toilets because they had no infrastructure. There was nothing was working. And it, it was it was it was very rewarding to say the least. We were able to go in and help the utility. We were also, um, when people found out the level of skills that our operators brought to the table, the other NGOs, you know, and UNICEF and um, Water Mission came and asked us for help. 
Is Jason coming out of a sea can? Can you explain? Uh, th this was a, a water mission project. They wanted to set up a reverse osmosis system in a sea can, or four of them actually, and we're going to have a husband and wife team from a church put this together. I offered our help. Jason, do you want to explain what you did? Of course. Of course. Yeah, uh, the Bahamas was a very different type of disaster. You could go get a cheeseburger at Wendy's, but you couldn't have fresh water come out of your taps. So every day that you were washing your dishes, it was salt water. All the, all the water was salinated, unfortunately. So what this mission uh, had done is they, had, they were trying to set up on one of the old wells a reverse osmosis system. So they had all the equipment, but they weren't quite sure what they were gonna do with it. So devised a plan with a sea can of putting multiple of these reverse osmosis systems in it and then pumped to a bladder and then they would transport the water all over the island. And we set this up at a school. But as Val had mentioned, it was a husband and wife team and they were very capable, but a little short on knowledge on a few, few things. So we offered our assistance. So we went in and in a little over a day, we set up four of these reverse osmosis systems inside of one sea can where we would pump to this large bladder so they could transport all over the island as well as it was at a school. So while we were doing this, you could see we set up a line that went over to the school so all the kids could walk over and fill up their water bottles because most people at their homes didn't have fresh water. In Bahamas, we had to devise a plan where we went in to look at all of their wells because what had happened was the sea rose by about 15 feet and put all of their very shallow wells underwater. So as you can imagine, all the salt infiltrated the freshwater systems. So, so we went around and looked at every well and assessed it for if it, you know, the power lines had been ripped down or if the pump had been broken or any back check valves weren't working. And there was a number, almost 600 wells, because these were all very shallow wells. We even went to a different part of the island where they hadn't been using the water in a long time. They brought a number of these wells back online. What we did through a process of daily checks, we would see what the salinity levels were in each of these wells, and then we'd turn them off, the ones that were higher salt levels, and turn the ones on that had lower salt levels. So we could start doing this. And we, we, we devised this in the first two weeks, and then we sent number of teams for weeks thereafter out continuing to do this work. And I'm going to show the picture of you with the children, Jason. Do you want to just talk a little bit about those little children? Yes, of course, of course. But so as we traveled across the island, we met a number of different people and we were assessing some of the different stations where we could set up these water plants. And uh, this lady came up to us with her two little children and, and this one little boy, he was so excited to see what we were doing and so inquisitive. So I gave him a pair of gloves because I asked him what he was doing. And him and his sister and his mother had just come to help his grandparents. And their whole house had been wiped out. A, a complete devastation had taken their house into the ocean. And they were there just trying to help. So when we gave them some gloves, they were so happy. We just brought them along with us. And when talking to this little boy's mother, she was talking about how blessed they were um, because they were still able to see her, her, her mother, because it was her father, I or her brother, I believe, right, Val? That oh, unfortunately, that was a different one. yeah, that was a different oh, one. I'll okay. talk about that in a moment, Jason. All right, all right. But but they were there, just they were happy as can be that you know the sun was shining and it was a beautiful day. Meanwhile, they had lost their house and everything within it, and this was just one experience of many that we meet daily. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Ian and Max, stay on the line and um, we'll make up some questions for you from the audience later. So uh, the situation that Jason was referring to, we were going over to one of the keys which had been destroyed and we're waiting for a little boat, a little fishing boat to take us over there. And there was a lady sitting by the key just having some lunch had been provided by World Kitchen who are a fantastic organisation that go in to disaster areas and provide food. And I said to her, were you from this area? She said, yes. I said, how did you make out? She said, oh, I am so blessed. She said, my house is still standing. It was a fairly new house, and the walls and the foundation are still there. She didn't have a roof. She didn't have any furniture left, didn't have any windows left. But she was grateful for what she had. And she pointed over there and said, that's my parents' house. 
completely level, just literally a pile of rubble, like you saw in the video. And I said, but did you manage to evacuate? And she said, yes, we were lucky. We went to Freeport with my two children, my husband and my parents. She said, but my brother decided to stay because he had started a new business and he was afraid that it would get looted after the storm. She said he and his whole family, his wife and two children were killed. And she said, it makes you very, very emotional because it's humbling. They're there thanking you for being there when this is the situation. They're telling you that they're blessed because she's still got walls and yet she's lost most of, a lot of her family. And Jason, do you just want to just say what it means to you personally to, to go and volunteer? Yes, yes, uh, of course. Um, I sometimes I feel a little bit greedy about going on these missions because I take so much away. Um, when we go there, just with our daily knowledge that we have, I, I, I'm a tradesman and I run a couple of utilities here in Ontario. Um, but the knowledge that we have on our day to day that we can give these people, they take so much away. Being able to give somebody water that hasn't had it, um, making lifelong friends. I talk to a number of people from Bahamas and Dominica every Christmas when the kids' birthdays are, we're, we're messaging each other back and forth. These are really, really special events that we get to go on and help these people and change their lives. So these, these missions, they, they can be tough, and, but you know, we're lucky, we have good food that we're, sometimes home cooked food, we're lucky enough to have local home cooked food, but meeting so many people and wonderful people and being able to make these life changing I have so many stories where I could tell you about people coming up to me while we're walking down the street or on the beach and thanking me when they have nothing. They don't even have a house to live in, but they're thankful that we're there. So we feel very blessed to be able to do this. Thanks, Jason. So I'll move on now and just tell a little bit very quickly about what we're doing in Haiti. Um, so we're working with the Rotary Clubs uh, in, a, in a special program they have called Hand Wash, and you can advance. Um, so this is uh, the fellow who started this, Barry Rasson, who was their international president. And he says, the dream is to bring potable water to every citizen in Haiti by the year 2030. He said, this is a right. It is an incredibly ambitious program. But we are working with them at Operators Without Borders as capacity, doing capacity building. So one of the things that we've focused on is non-revenue water and building SOPs for their processes. If the revenue, their revenue was, um, non-revenue water was running a leakage at 90%. I'm not talking one nine, I'm talking nine zero. We did a training program for them on district metered areas. We did it remotely. I cannot send anybody to Haiti. It is too dangerous right now. But by implementing the training that we did, within three months, the non-revenue water is down to 42%, from 90 to 42, and we're going for less than 30. Now, 30 might be high in our utilities, but I'll tell you, this makes it sustainable. They're on meters, people pay for the water. Um, they get a lot of theft, but with the district metered areas, and now with the pressure that's going through the pipes, when somebody's tapping into a line to steal it, that water is going sky high, and the mayor and the people from the village know who's done it, and they go to the house and say, stop stealing our water. So we've got seven projects running in Haiti right now. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but... Um, so half of Haiti's water and sanitation infrastructure does not function. And when you say half, that's the, it's the, the infrastructure that they have. A lot of the, they don't have a lot of infrastructure, especially around wastewater. And right now there's another cholera outbreak. So this is something that is desperately needed in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So we have other projects going. Right now, yesterday I was on the phone with Turkey. Uh, we won't be going there for the, uh, probably a couple of months. We might send an advanced person to help do an assessment, but we're working with uh, the WASH group and we're working with different pe people in Turkey, and I would think within two to three months we will have boots on the ground in Turkey. It is just utter devastation, and it's cold, people don't have a place to live, they need water. And then the other places we're working, is, of course, is in Ukraine. 
The safety of my volunteers is my number one priority. I cannot send anybody there right now, but I spent most of the summer in Poland working with the Poles and Ukrainians in putting plans together. We're implementing those plans. So I'll now turn it to anybody who has any questions. Um, we'd love you to get involved. Um, our website, it, just Google Operators Without Borders. I don't need to give you the whole thing. If you, we come up usually first if you uh, go to there. You can find out how to become a member, which is $50 um, for three years, not $50 a year, and that's Canadian, so that's like about $3 American <laughs> with our exchange rate. Um, so consider becoming a member. If you'd like to volunteer, there's volunteer information. It takes a while to fill out because we need to know what your qualifications are. When we have a disaster, like if we go into, into Turkey, I will send out a blank email to our whole network and say who is able to come in the next few months. And then that's how we, we go. So I go first and I look at the qualifications because sometimes we need uh, desalination experts. Sometimes we need people with well expertise. So we always make sure that on a team we have somebody with the expertise. So I find that from the database that we have. Um, so are there any questions or, uh, for either myself or for Mac or Jason in the couple of minutes we have left? I'm just going to mention something since there might not be questions on this topic, but I just wanted to speak to this audience, which is more of a technical audience. And what uh, another example, I know we have a short time frame, so Val didn't mention it, is we often draw in academic expertise or technical experts. Uh, for example, we were doing some work with a large utility in South America, a very large city who happened to have a particular parameter they wanted to treat or eliminate. So what we did paired up with the university to help them out. So there is a role for technical people by all means. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Okay. So any questions? They all look very keen, don't they? <laughs> Either that or they're asleep. It's early in, early Monday morning. You have coffee in the corner rather than... Just again, on the technical nature, um, the places we go to, they need innovative solutions. They need solutions quick. Like Jason talked about, you know, what they had to do. He didn't get into depth. Of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, intuitiveness and ingenuity. And this is a great opportunity for those doing research or those in the technical area to, to look at a problem there and say, hey, I know it's not the average solution, but here, try this. They have these materials. They have these supplies. We think you could use our technology. And we like to hear those things, so thank you. So thank you very, very much for your time and attention on an early Monday morning. Thank you.